I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, I'm still here in uh, North Carolina because, as we've told you before, we usually film two podcasts together. So uh, I'm still here. Had the had the wedding, Layla's wedding. Uh, was uh, New Year's Eve, which was, you know, I think Lisa said it would be one, two, three, one, two, three will be her wedding date, which oh, I yeah. didn't realize that. But one of the things I didn't mention when we were talking about the wedding earlier was that it was spiritual. I was talking about that and just so godly and good and just so full of energy. But one of the things that touched me so much was that Fred, who is Zach and Jill's youngest son. So I guess he's Layla's younger brother, youngest brother. Yeah, and thanks for so, bringing back the name Fred, Zach. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a throwback. We're bringing it back. I like it. And so Fred is up front. You know, he's part of the wedding party. And how old is Fred? He's uh, 12. 12 years old. And so I'm watching him, you know, because you're looking at all the people. Everybody's rapt attention. Mia's up there. Jay. Well, about... I don't know, halfway through the vows, he just starts crying. <laughs> he lost it. I mean, just like crying, like having to wipe his uh, eyes on his coat. And, you know, you just, he's in front of this large audience of people, but he can't stop. And uh, <laughs> he did And at first I was looking at it and I thought, well, that's a neat thing. Well, then the more I thought about he, his older sister's getting married and I don't know what, you know, got to him so much, but then I started crying. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to look away. <laughs> I had to look away because I thought, well, this is going to be bad if I just start bawling. <laughs> he, he, he's a sweet kid. Later that night, he he, he goes, uh, he said, you know what? I got thinking about it. He said, I didn't really lose anything. I just gained a brother. So he, <laughs> he's reframed it now. Now Dawson. So he was thinking about losing his sister. I think he's just yeah. like, she's leaving, you know, but, you know. Um, well, I just, it was really touching. I mean, it showed me how close your kids are. Yeah, they're close. Now, I mean, he, now, I'm a little upset with Fred right now, though. He has, oh boy. Oh, he has <laughs> been creating havoc, Jace. I mean, havoc in the yard. Because you know what he got for Christmas? Uh oh. Don't tell me a metal detector. He got what? a metal detector for Christmas. Oh, boy. And now, my, my, and, and he goes out every day. Ben got him a metal detector. Yeah. Or Grant, one of them, one of them got him a metal detector, and I mean, it's it it looks like the. Well, movie. I noticed oh. when I came in, it looked like you'd been doing some digging. I thought you might have had some kind of. Uh, and then he brings problem. in like all this stuff because my house was built in eighteen, eighteen ninety. <laughs> so oh. I mean, I've literally got. I looked in the back of my truck, like in back in the back seat of my truck, and there's this towel, and I pick it up to try to pull it out. Where I'm like, it's like, and then I realize I open it, it's wrapped up. I open it up and there's all this iron and like I mean I don't even know what it is. It's all <laughs> kind of I mean all kinds cans. Of, <laughs> so, so appreciate the uh, influence. That's Chase. Chase's influence. The that's revolution what, has begun. <laughs> <laughs> A twelve-year-old son of Zach yep. has started the revolution. Yes, and now my gonna, yard looks like a Robertson yard. It's uh, <laughs> we're I have joined the ranks of the Robertsons in the yard. We're gonna dig up the earth. That's right. So, Jace, you started. You started the trend. Well, the Lord yeah. started it with putting those illustrations about finding lost treasure. So, you need to make your spiritual analysis on that. Oh, yeah, I do. Oh. I need to. I need to rein it, rein it in a little bit too, though. Well, it's funny you said that. Al. We did uh, this year for Christmas, one of our Christmas celebrations, kind of with Missy side of the family. Uh, Mia organized just a, kind of a worship night, and uh, so they were. They just we just sang worship songs, and uh, there was a couple of Christmas songs. And so, but every time Missy, you know, she she stood up because she was all about this. Every song she would start to sing, she just started started crying on every song. I was like, babe, look, uh, I'm not sure why you're crying so much, but when we lose you, you know, we need your voice here. When <laughs> you, you stop stay, singing, yeah. <laughs> this slowly turns into a great idea that's not being executed very well. <laughs> It takes some. Well, voices. you got well. Mia can sing, and Re, and and Reed can sing. I don't know about. Oh can yeah, Cole, what, is Oh can yeah, Cole they, sing? they everybody can sing, but me. And uh, but I don't know. Missy's like one of the strong singers, and uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe Karina was kind of looking at me, and uh, she's our our daughter from Nicaragua that we acquired. And so I, me and her sat beside each other just to kind of make us feel better. That's our section. 
Is that yeah. the joyful noise section? Yeah, YouTube? joyful noise section. But uh, so you make me out in your heart section, <laughs> not out loud. But, but you I know, really, it's I really like it, that flavor to Christmas though. Just the family gathering up, and of course, you know, we have a lot of talented singers. But it is it is moving. Just well, I even noticed Jesus. at our at our Jay's at our big Christmas this year. It really was a kind of a passing of the torch because last year we met at Jason Missy's house. First time we had met at mom and dad's because we've literally. When all the Robertsons are together, Dad, when all your patriarchy is together, we're too big for your house. The it's house too much work. In. It's so yeah, much it, work. I saw poor yeah. Jeff and Jessica, you know, when I walked in, just the way they looked, I thought, yep, I remember that last year. <laughs> it, it's just a load to have 75 people in your house and to cook well, and, 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 and to feed charge. them. And so we're always kind of committed to Louisiana um, cuisine. And so dad always, dad and mom always did it. It was too, way too much for them now to feed that many people. What'd y'all do? So we kicked the fried shrimp to the curb. That was a long tradition that we stopped because you can't feed fried shrimp to six, 60 or 70 nah, people. Too it's, too, it's too much work. So this year we did, Jep did a jambalaya. Lisa made some white beans because if you're from Louisiana, if you're going to eat jambalaya, you got to have some white beans to put on your jambalaya. You got to do the big pot or like a smaller yeah, pot? Big, not as not the huge one like the one you make, but the kind of medium size. Yeah. But then Missy, fresh uh-huh. off her success of the crawfish oh, she pie. She brought the crawfish pie. Crawfish no. pie. And she made the shrimp au gratin. She, or some hey, how about that? They were the, delicious. They were delicious. So you, you, you give the thumbs up. Thumbs up, double thumbs what, up. Phil, did you eat them? Did you eat the crawfish pie? Oh yeah, it's good. And the yes, and everything the, was delicious. Yeah, and the no, she did crawfish all right. Okay, I thought it was shrimp. I couldn't, but it was really good. And then she did some kind of somebody did a crawfish dip, and I don't know if it's Missy or somebody else, but I don't know who made it, but it was delicious. So I thought, well, Dad, we have officially now crossed over that your progeny can cook dishes as well as you and mom. That's so, when you know yeah. you've succeeded. Now, my, my progeny did crawfish as well. Max went and bought, which I would not recommend this, they were like boiled crawfish, but they were frozen in a bag. Mm. So I guess they you, you reboil them. And I'm like, wow. And I'm like, why would you why would you do that? Well, he they ate, him and Fred ate them. This was about a week and a half ago. I go in the garage yesterday <laughs> And I mean, <laughs> oh, they the left the, the, the they shelf. Left the husk. I, there were, I, I searched for it. There's a, a a trash bag with crawfish shells. All in. I was oh, I was hot. <laughs> so we got that going on too. That the problem with your progeny is your sons, because you know I watched the yeah. I watched the Alabama game last night, which they lost. Which yeah. this will be a week out, but and he's a huge Alabama fan, but. Just watching his reactions to the game, I thought, "Yeah, you you got you got some strong willed." <laughs> I got five strong willed children. <laughs> I mean, they're great, they're godly, but man, you talk about your boys, you talk about get into some stuff. So, and I was just watching that unfold last night. Of course, I I felt bad for him. He needed some help. He's the only Alabama fan in a room full of people that giving him a hard time. So, <laughs> it was kind of hard for him. I felt kind of felt sorry for him, but anyway. That's well, we we did. Uh, I, I just thought it was it was good. I think people with larger families and you break down into smaller groups because uh, we did the fried shrimp on one of our yeah smaller guys. Christmases. We did the same thing. Yeah, yeah. but I, I'm I'm gonna tell you this uh, Missy's transformation into when I first married her in the cooking world. It's come a long way. Come a long way. It is almost <laughs> supernatural Christmas miracle. <laughs> I mean, and now that confidence, she's just taking yeah. on everything. I mean, I hate to yeah. tell you all this because don't adjust your your screens, the, those of you who are uh, watching this. So she made four sweet potato pies for that Robertson 75 gathering that only yeah. two pieces were eaten of because there were so many desserts. I made and my I, pies. And I'm yeah. sure they knew that Kay, Miss Kay, she's retired from, from the cooking end of it. And they thought, oh, somebody tried that. But I'm going to tell you something. For every Robertson member who thought, oh, Miss Kay didn't make those. I'm not eating those because I was that guy for 30 years. Whenever I went to a gathering and 
Because you normally eat a whole pie of mom's. Well, I hate to tell you this, that since no one ate the pie because they were scared of the unknown. You helped him. <laughs> he ate out. four pies. I ate four pies <laughs> in five days. Whew. That's good. So that's why I'm taking so many deep breaths, and, and I keep looking at Al right now for you who are watching, and I realize that Zach, he, he set this design where him and Al, they're seating there, but he actually yeah. put a halo well, it looks like to me there's a halo over Al's head. And I <laughs> thought, is. Yeah. is there some kind of spiritual reference here? <laughs> it could be. So, it Al, is, you look like an angel It's probably to me. my spirit just coming out naturally yeah. as to this group, who, who, the, who the, the Lord's light is shining on. So. I but I, just, I mean, she, she has that pie. It, it's not close to being. It, it is absolutely... I mean, it is the, the Jesus moment that we left off where he said, now, post-resurrection, he said, now I'm sending you. Somewhere <laughs> in there, Missy got it. She's been and sent. she's been sent out of Kay's kitchen with the mm. power to make the greatest pie on earth, Miss Kay's recipe on the sweet potato pies. And I tested it thoroughly with four pies. I've had a lot of bathroom time, but... I've lived to tell about it. <laughs> yeah, sweet uh, potato is pretty powerful uh, tubular when you eat a yeah, lot of You got to be careful with that. I His dad it. would say there can be a lot of lower bowel mischief. Mischief. Um, well, Missy said, the... we have all these pies. You need to throw them out. It's been after about day three. And I was like, we're not throwing out those pies. We got I'm, two I'm, more days. I'm going to systematically eat all those pies. Just give me a, one more day. So I do last love night, it that I finished it off. That's a sweet that our potato family, going a long way. <laughs> I do love it that our family loves looking back and taking the best of what was there. Yesterday, we're here in North Carolina. It's, of course, New Year's Day was yesterday, and we were we ate the cabbage and the black eyed peas and uh, pork roast. Melissa made all that. Lisa made the cornbread. We had a lot of stuff to go with it, but it was really cool because it was like I remember doing that when I was a kid. You know, kind of the traditional things. You know, we said we're tired of Zach making yeah. all the cabbage. So, because cabbage is supposed to be representative the of dollars, the, the, dollars. the dollars. And you got the black eyed peas, which is luck, which we don't really believe in luck. We believe in God's providence. But, but we, we participated in that here. And it just, I guess the whole thing for me this holiday has been next generation. Like, we're passing it along. We're, we're taking what we learned from our parents and grandparents. And now we're passing that to our children and grandchildren. Yeah. So it really is kind it's of. It's weird that some of those meals you eat and that you that first bite it could take you back. Yeah, I made a uh, corn and shrimp soup last week, and uh, which I hadn't done in a long time, but I, I immediately was transported back to my aunt Judy's house. Yeah, that's right. You know, it was delicious. which is where we spent most of our holidays with the, with the big Robertson gathering. When you think of liver health. It, it takes me back to when I was a kid, and one of the things we used to eat was liver. <laughs> and I didn't like it. <laughs> but when I realized that I have one, which was probably in my teenage years, I thought I need to take care of that because yeah. it just something about it already that just seems wrong. <laughs> Don't mess with your liver. Don't mess with your well, liver. Well, I'm just saying, it has it has some... It has a lot of challenges. So, so Zach and I know, uh, latest data, American Heart Association says that uh, adults with fatty liver were three and a half times more likely to have heart failure. So you can tell this when you go and do blood work, you get a certain age, your liver enzymes are high. And the liver, liver and the heart got a thing going. They got a thing going. You got to have that liver. Uh, you got to have it working. It gives you energy. Um, so it has 500 key functions. So you definitely want your liver to be healthy. So we have some friends at Liver Health Formula. I have taken this product. It did get my numbers back in line. So even though I'm still working on the outer fatty part, the fatty liver is a lot better. They have 11 clinically proven botanicals that recharge and protect your liver. Uh, when you order from Liver Health Formula, you're going to get a free bottle a blood sugar formula is going to help reduce your sugar cravings. So try Liver Health Formula by going to getliverhelp.com slash unashamed to claim your free bonus gift. That's getliverhelp.com slash unashamed. Well, 
Well, the more I do Christmas, you know, I mean, it's it's I love how it's transitioned in. It's mainly about Jesus. You know, it's it's about worship. You know, at our at our house because we did three different, I guess, get-togethers at my house during the week, and then the food has escalated now that Missy has taken on that role. But the presents are way down the list. And, uh, you know, I give all my kids a $100 bill, and I've been doing it for the last four or five years, I guess since I could obtain $100 bills the last four or five years. And so, you know, at first, Missy's was like, well, I mean, why do you give them a $100 bill? But Mia this year, so I thought about, maybe I should just do some shopping like everybody else. And my daughter, Mia, when she came home for the week, she said, Dad, I'm so excited about the present you're going to give me. And I said, was it the same one I gave you last year? She said, yeah, I'm counting on it. <laughs> <laughs> so forget going so, to Dollar General. You better just keep that. So I said, I'm I, taking I, this. Of course, Jace, I will give you one piece of advice. That the, the 100 is the, is the new 50, so you might want to up the – yeah, inflation's been bad, so you might want to up your your hundred. Well, I gave I too. gave my hundred, and everybody was happy. But then I also played a parody because you know we don't do many gifts, but they all have their gifts, you know. And so I, I I just noticed how to fit in. So for you who are people like me out there, that's not really into the materialistic idea of Christmas. I've noticed what you say, and it's it's what I noticed when. My wife goes shopping. There's a grid you go through. So when they open the present, because I want to tell you this, Phil, because I thought you might struggle with this also. So no matter what comes out, you say, isn't that cute? Because they (laughs) say that about everything. And I've never approached it at any time. And then you, so then you follow Dad, it up. Have you ever said in your life, isn't that cute? Have have those words ever come out of your mouth? I never got on that level. Yeah, so here's the grid for the shoppers, Phil, the people who get into the presence. They say, isn't that cute? And then the next question is, is it on sale? Did you get that on sale? Because there's a sale for everything, especially during Christmas time. Even they'll mark it up for what it normally is, then give it 30% off to where it was before Christmas because you have to be able to say, I got this on sale. And so, and, and to prove my point, Mia got Cole some kind of sweater thing. But on the tag, she wrote a note and said, this was $139. And I got it <laughs> for twenty nine ninety five. Just so you know. Just so you Just know. Just so you know how big a deal this was. Not only is it cool and awesome, but I noticed that. And so then you have to come with numbers. So you, you ask. Now, when they're shopping, they add one, one other thing. Because if when they say, how much is it? They say, isn't that cute? How much is it? Well, you don't it, get it, much look, $100 it, anymore. If it's overpriced, they'll, they'll say, that's ridiculous. You know, they'll never buy that. But, but when, the, so they, when they bought it, though, there had to be a sale involved. So you're like, did you get that on sale? So I did this as a parody, thinking they would notice that I was making fun of them. Nobody noticed because I played the game. Oh, isn't that cute? Did you get that on sale? Oh, yeah. And then here's the key phrase. Wow, you saved a lot of money. Because I noticed when my wife comes in, she says, you're not going to believe how much money I saved. And I'm thinking, well, didn't you just go shopping? But that was 20 years ago when I would say that. But it's all about the justification. So it's like I went out and saved tons of money today. Look at what I got. So there, it, only had, it only had to spend 500 bucks just to do it. Well, yeah, you don't want to ask that, first. but you'll just nah. say, boy, you really saved a lot of money. You <laughs> really did. You did a good job. What? Yeah. Great. And that, if you just follow that grid, you can go right on through. Yeah, I may get the there side. one of these days. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> but you left out one, Jays. What about the, that's just ridiculous. Well, that's I mean, at the store that happens if it's too much. That's yeah, you ridiculous. Don't, you don't say that while you're opening the press. No, and right. I left out the return 
issue, which you don't want to bring that Last up. time I checked, you don't get a whole lot with $100. Well, when they right. say, look, when they say, I'm going to go return some things that I got from Christmas, I used to think, oh, yeah, they're going to go get their money back. No. No. That is code for there's a new shopping spree that's (laughs) That's fixed to happen. Because I'm going to return this, get that money, and then I'm going to spend that 10 times more on anything else I see. And so then that shopping experience is actually greater than the original one. The return money is like government money. That's free. That's free money. That's free money. That didn't cost me anything. I got the money back from just turning this in, so I'm going to go spend that and some more money, which is what happens with the government. Oh, I got another one for you, though. I got I got two more for you that I've, I've uncovered this year of how they, they can save money for you. Is when if you have credit card points then, and they purchased it on your points, exactly. then it was free. Yeah. So if you get like – I got a, a, a one of my cards, they get cash back, and I got a – I had, you know, I, I've never cashed out the cash balance in years. I've got 1500 bucks in there. So that money got spent on Amazon, but it, but everything that was bought out of that money was, it was free. That's right. Free gifts. I was like, exactly. but you, I was like, it's not, it's not free. I said, it's not free. You, you did. You had to spend it. money to get it. And then Jill had another account where she had made some money in that she had money in and everything that she spent out of that account was free too. That was free. Oh, that didn't cost us anything. <laughs> I didn't? No, that came out of my account. I was like. <laughs> so we're so helping co- We're helping each other adapt to that tension that's always in the shopping world. Yeah. So we had two Christmas miracles, and I'm going to use that word really loosely, on the shopping end of it. So I actually, in a moment of weakness, thought, well, I ought to get my wife something. And so I said, I'm this year I'm going to just listen, and I'm going to try to surprise her. Anything she likes, anything she mentions, I was listening. So we're watching football one day, because my wife, she loves football much as I do. And they had some kind of special uh, military-driven angle at, at outfitting the coaches and all. And they had an American flag. It was going to the military. And I heard her say while we were watching the game, oh, man, because we were watching the Saints game. She was like, I love that, whatever it was. It was like a hoodie or whatever, and it was a different color than the normal Saints thing. So I just reached over there, got my phone, and ordered it. You know, I, I was like, women small, I guess, bam. She'll never know. It would be the greatest surprise ever. So when I when I came home the day before Christmas, Missy said, you're not going to believe what's what's happened. And I said, what? She said, I ordered uh, Brighton this hoodie because she's a big Saints fan. And two of them came in. And I couldn't get a woman's small because they were sold out. So I had to get a man's small. and was just hoping it's going to be big enough. So I walked out. I said, well, let me look. I said, I'm sure there's, you know, let me see if I can. I was acting. I didn't know what to do, you know. I walked in there, and she's got both of them. Land there, so I'm like, "What do I do here?" Because she thinks she or, she ordered one. Yeah, for I thought writing. she got one for free because she free. liked it. Yeah, and she's like, yeah. "They sent me two, so we have a moral issue here." Yeah. <laughs> and so I just looked at her and I said, "Merry Christmas." She said, "What?" I said, "I bought that. It has my name on it because I sent it to mine." I said, "You open my mail." And it had your Christmas present. <laughs> she said, this is a miracle. <laughs> it's a Christmas miracle. It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I'm never trying that again. She was like, oh, no, you know. I mean, Because you her... can't get a package oh. because the wives open all the packages. All right, hang on, Jason. I know you got another miracle. Let's take a break. So one of the awkward conversations of life is what happens – when you're gone, you know, for us, we're thinking about the afterlife and great, but you know, unfortunately the reason this is awkward is because the rest of your family is like, well, what did you leave me? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I hate it, you know, (laughs) but, uh, what, let's take a look at this. And it doesn't mean they love you any less. They're just like, you know, what can I do about it? Right. You know, you're gone. So, 
with that, this is, you know, it's just a real life problem, Al. It is. And dad, the older you get, the more you're kind of thinking this is going to happen sooner rather than later. I mean, you start piling up the years, right? In Jesus, the resurrection, you say. Hey, it's, that's what this podcast is about. It's beginning to wane. It's the ultimate insurance. That's right. But what Jace is talking about is one of our sponsors, the Policy Genius. What they do is they help you find the best deal for life insurance. Um, they have technology that makes it very easy to compare life insurance quotes from all the top uh, insurers in America. Just a few clicks, they're going to find your lowest price. If you already have a life insurance policy through work, it may not offer enough protection for your family. And so these guys are going to help you get what you need. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million dollars worth of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. So they work for you, Policy Genius, not the insurance companies. And that's why people love them. They got a lot of uh, five star reviews. And so we're asking you to save some time and money, give your family a financial safety net with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash Phil or click in the description to get your free life insurance quote and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Phil. So the other one was Missy got everybody matching pajamas, Christmas pajamas. Oh boy. Well, guess what? The miracle in my mind was mine never came in. My color. Everybody had a different color. Yeah. And so when she passed them all out, she skipped me. And she said, babe, I'm sorry. Yours did not come in. I guess it was just destiny. Oh. And uh, so everybody had their little colors. And I was thinking, boy, this is the greatest thing that ever happened, that I don't have to wear matching pajamas. Because <laughs> I was really excited. And then my son, his gift to me, without consulting with his mom, my wife, Missy, got me the exact color <laughs> pajamas, which we got to have a talk, me and my son. <laughs> and when my wife saw that, and she went nuts. She said, it's another Christmas miracle. <laughs> that was the color that they were, that I ordered you. And then Cole got, I mean, they're hugging over this, the excitement. It doesn't take a whole lot to get y'all stirred up, does it? <laughs> y'all is, I was not a part of it. I just thought I'd share that because this is what I think normal people do at Christmas, that I look at it from afar and think, boy, this is something. Did you feel like Ralphie pajama. on the Christmas story, that Jay's, when you had to put on that pink uh, rabbit outfit? I actually thought like? I was this close from not having to take a picture in this embarrassing moment. And then my son, in some weird thing, I told him, I was like, look, next year go something hunting related. The, the Christmas pajamas, that yeah. ain't. So anyway, we've, we've moved on. We so, I, I love Christmas, though, just because I think it's it's a time where, when people are actually open-minded to the Lord just because yeah. of the hoopla about it. So yeah. I encourage it. But now we have a new year, so... I don't know if we want to talk about New Year's resolutions. We're probably a couple weeks past the New Year by the time this comes out. Yeah, we're probably about a week out after that. But we haven't had a chance to talk about our Christmas experiences, so we did want to do that, even though that's a few weeks back for most of you if you've been listening. I guess we'll get to uh, back to our text, because in the last podcast, we're in Luke chapter 20 is where we are. And uh, I felt like we really opened up a really interesting discussion uh, that we took into overtime about we we got down to verse actually we started with this where we which was where we had left off about this resurrection and marriage text and remember just to understand the and remember the context of all this Jesus has come into Jerusalem he's commented what's going to happen there he went into the temple cleared it out basically saying this is my house you know but things are going to be different because he said in the book of John that this is going to be destroyed. And so then he sits down and starts doing some teaching. And as part of that teaching, he does the, he's starting to get asked these questions. And most of them are traps to try to pin something on him because they don't know what to do with Jesus. So he gets this question about marriage, and we talked about that. 
And then he responds with a really interesting thing because he because he makes this point about him God being a God of the living, not the dead. And he's making the point that in the resurrection, people who don't believe in an afterlife, you know, they're having trouble understanding what that's going to be like. So he brings up um, Psalm one ten to these people in verse forty one of chapter twenty, Luke. He uh, he quotes Psalm one ten, which we read in the last podcast. And of David saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then he said, David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? So he he presents this sort of time box paradox of how is David talking about a descendant in the same reference as talking about somebody who's before him and over him. And of course, from Jesus' perspective of coming outside of time and space into our time, he gets it perfectly. I mean, he understands. He was there. And so what we brought up in the in the last podcast was that when you go and read Psalm 110, we also went over and read John 7 and John 4, it, it and Hebrews 7, it even opens up even more because in Psalm 110, the whole psalm is a is a messianic prophecy, not just about who the Lord is, but also David brings up this idea of Melchizedek, who was another idea of someone outside of a secession or lineage, because yeah. he was a priest, you know, before there was a priesthood. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in here with the idea that Jesus is so unique as our king and priest, which we talked about, that he's outside of normal secession. He's not just that he came from the house of David, he came from God. And yet he also, because of the way God framed it, he does come from the lineage of David, and yet he's outside of David. I mean, it really is a yeah. powerful concept when you think about it. And I brought up the First Chronicles 17 because it's really about him delivering David from his enemies, and then through that there's this messianic prophecy that out of his line would a kingdom would be established. But when you right. read the whole chapter, there's a lot about this in saying that he will subdue all his enemies. And yeah. so when he says Which also here, comes up, Jace, in Psalm 110, in that exact, Messianic prophecy, right. I was fixed to make the same point. And so when he says in Luke 20, when he says this, that that what you read, until I'm, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I thought about that phrase, which is something you read and it just kind of glosses over your head. But I went on a little run about that in the Bible because the first thing I thought of was 1 Corinthians 15 when it says in verse 22, For as an Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive for each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. After he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he must put everything under his feet. And I also thought about Philippians 3, where he says in verse 18, for as I have often told you before and say again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly body so that they will be like his glorious body. And it just made me think, when you think of earthly kingdoms, how do they view enemies? Well, they view enemies, anybody that's trying to kill them or overthrow their power or insurrectionists. Or... But when Jesus is talking about here, the enemies that he will destroy He's talking about, you know, when he brought up that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when you think about enemies of the cross, you know, and he gives these 
this illustration of people, you know, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, their mind is on earthly things. When you think about the enemies of the cross, the enemies of the resurrection, and you just see that his kingdom and what it entails is way bigger than some kind of earthly kingdom where we're going to, you know, use some kind of physical force to take over the world. It's more of a spiritual thing, but it's also a bodily resurrection thing where the true enemies of life and the true enemies of any kind of kingdom, Jesus conquered death itself. It's just it's just a way better kingdom. It, it, it has way better answers to humanity. So we're super excited. We got a brand new sponsor. Uh, it's called Refuge Privacy. And basically, it's a, a Faraday sleeve, uh, which blocks out people from being able to access your data um, on your phone and spy on you. So that's, that's. Can I speak for Phil in this moment? Yeah. <laughs> is that what, is that what you're thinking? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to know everything that's going on in the world. So all I need, I need a telephone. Phil, your data must be protected, and these are the people that's going to help. Well, and these and our sponsors, they listen to. They our, get what I'm trying to. They say. listen to our podcast because it says right here in my copy. Uh, mentioned the episode that Phil talked about switching to his whole old school telephone. So they realize that you're an old school man. So one of the things they're wanting to capture is that one of the reasons you would do that, Dad, is to keep people from accessing you, which they can through this. Yeah. But they can't through your old home telephone unless you pick it up. Correct. So they like that. So this is what you're getting, a happy medium, uh, because here's what happens. Uh, big tech, big government, stalkers, hackers. They track you, and they do it through the cell phone. And this sounds a lot like you know 1984 and Orwell, but it's actually true. That's what I was referring to them. And, and they're agreeing with you. So what they've come up with is an American-made buffalo leather Faraday sleeve that also blocks sound and high frequency that 5G signals and other sleeves miss. So there's some other sleeves out there, but this one is the best. It looks great. It's buffalo leather, which is tough. I mean, what's tougher than a buffalo hide, right? So, Dad, you, Dad give another thumbs up. I like it. If you don't see the need for one of these today, then they say you're not paying attention. So, to go, so here's what you do: go to refugeprivacy.com and use the code Phil and save fifteen percent off your order. So that's refugeprivacy.com. Use the promo code Phil, save fifteen percent on your order, and block out. Well done. I think about that verse, uh, verse five in Psalm one ten, which we hadn't read the rest of. That, the Lord is at your right hand. This is again a messianic prophecy from David in Psalm one ten. He's talking about somebody other than himself. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. So in the language he was using, the picture is exactly what Jace was describing. That's all enemies, all kingdoms. And then it's interesting because in the NIV, it says he will drink from a brook beside the way. I'm not sure why they translated that way, but if you look down the margin, another translation, which I think is much better for the point here he's making, the one who grants secession will set him in authority, which to me fits the context way better because He's talking about this idea that God has set him in place as a descendant of David. And I thought that was really interesting because Zach made the point in the last podcast about when you read Matthew 1 and Luke 3, you read about the lineage. And there's two different lineages there that split off at David. And we know now that Luke 3 was the lineage of Mary, which was Jesus' physical link. But it came through not Solomon, not the royal line, but, yeah. but Nathan, his son, and then you read the royal line, which came to Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. Uh, but what's interesting is Jesus wasn't Joseph's son. So even though the royal line went to Joseph, he wasn't really Joseph's son. He was royal before that lineage. He was royal because the one who grants secession appointed him to be king. 
And so think about how fascinating this is. So Jewish, the Jewish history look at it and they say, well, he's not from Bethlehem. Well, he was because he was born there. They just didn't know it because he grew up in Nazareth. Then they said, well, he's not of the lineage of David. Well, he is yeah. two, two ways in terms of the earthly connection. But then none of that matters because the reason he's king is because the almighty God, Yahweh, said, I will appoint the king. And it will come through the idea of David, but it's bigger than David. So, I mean, I've always been fascinated by the idea of Jesus being so much bigger than anything we can contemplate in our earthly minds. And And, and then then flowing out of that, you see the same exact secession or type of secession, even in our inclusion as Gentiles, that there's, I mean, even the Old Testament is so much written about prophetically that I'm going to call people who are not my people, my people. Yes. I'm going to call those who aren't Israel, Israel. I'm going to graft in people who, uh, you, you see it, but they don't have the DNA. They don't have, they, but, and, and that's really what kind of Paul's point is, I think, in the book of Romans. You know, he starts off the book of Romans, and he said, I mentioned this in the last podcast. We kind of overlooked this a lot, but he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And through his son, uh, and through his and, and uh, through the Holy Scripture regarding his son, who as the human nature was a descendant of David. Yeah. So there, there's this idea that, but but and, and and through the Spirit of holiness was declared to be with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. There's that secession you were talking about through him and for his namesake. We we have received Paul speaking here, grace and apostleship, and there's the reason to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience of faith. So even our inclusion as Gentiles, it's like it's never the way that you think it's going to be because right. you think, oh, you got to have the lineage, you got to have the royal royalty, you got to have all this in place. And, and we're overlooking that God is sovereign. He's bigger than all of that. And whatever he's calling Christ to or whatever he's calling us to is bigger than some kind of like earthly kingdom DNA structure with borders and land and physical temples. It's way bigger than that. And Jace made the point from Hebrews 7 in the last podcast, that's why the Hebrew writer said he becomes our priest, not because of a lineage through Aaron or even Melchizedek, but because of an indestructible life. In other words, when he raised from the dead, that was the game changer for everything, because then we know that we can live in the present outside of time and space because we will be in perfection. And so, well, which is which is his? I mean, Jesus' his response in Luke twenty to their to what they said. He does not give validity for him being a Davidic king, which he could have. Yep. Instead, he he actually addresses the core of their heart issue. And it's and and their motivation. So you think because they had put all their hope in the system. Yep. They had put their hope in the temple. They had put their hope in the. Uh, this is the, the the Pharisees and Sadducees collectively. Like they had put their hope in in, in in the scriptures. They had put their hope in all these things that were of God, but they weren't God. And I think that's the big. That's the big turning point with Jesus. So is what he's saying is, is you, you're putting your hope in the things of God. You're not putting your hope. And in that's God. actually what he says next. Let's take our last break. Because in verse 45, he says, while all the people were listening, this is after he presents this paradox. Jesus says to his disciples, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes, and they love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. So he presents this picture of what Zach was describing, this elitism that somehow they deserve something better because they've done this, that, or the other, whatever they believe. And he's like, they've missed the whole point of what this is about. And, and unfortunately you see the exact same thing today. Yeah. People thinking somehow it's because of what I'm accomplishing, what I'm doing. Well, I think they, they miss the application of what the kingdom's going to look like because it says several times, true religion is that is faultless is, you know, helping widows and and orphans and keeping oneself from being polluted by the world. But Jesus' holiness and character and interactions with people was always 
helping the poor, dealing with injustice, defeating racism, you know, helping the afflicted. Touching the demon, lepers. You know. Yeah, touching lepers, dealing with uh, demon possessed. I mean, it he was a nasty business. Nasty. It wasn't yeah, like. I, it, he was basically trying to do what all the political worlds and, and social methods that we do attempt to do on the earth. But Jesus was doing it by the power of God. He comes up with this illustration on well, how would, would David say, the Lord said to my Lord. And just for a practical verse that explains that, when you know, when Paul wrote to the Romans, to Zach's point about you know us as Gentiles being included in this plan that started in Israel, you know, he brings up Israel in in chapter nine in the beginning verses that says, uh, you know, he said, "I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish." This is Romans nine two in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. But here's a very profound verse, and I think it goes into his statement in Luke 20. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ. And you can go all the way back. To David. But, but then it says this, who is God over all forever praised. So here's the bridge of humanity coming from the Son of God, Jesus, the God and man. And so that's how he could say that, is that the word Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. But he was also able to do all these miracles. He was also able to be flawless. He was also able to take all our sins on his back. He was also defeated death itself. And so what does that look like? Well, these people in the spirit of religion and having a temple without Jesus where they were going to worship and show how awesome they were by lengthy prayers and whatever, that that negates Jesus' whole point in what we read in Luke 6, on what the spirit of people who are following Jesus would look like, the giving up everything you have, selling everything you have. So that's the practical matter how it ends. The, these people were confident in their own righteousness. They love money. They love power. It was all a show. And that's why Jesus was hanging out in the temples. Because he was like, you got this wrong. There's a new temple coming. You're looking at him. There is a God. I, I'm him. I came from the line of David, but also I'm the son of God. I mean, that's why you have all these conversations on who do you think he is, which applies perfectly to us today. So even when he did that in first, I brought up that first Corinthians 15, but even in first Corinthians 15 and Paul I think it's the most used verse in churches today because we get up and remind people of the gospel. The sermon I heard this past su Sunday, it was a reminder of the gospel. But I think it's worthy of note to get back to that John 20 I did in the bonus time of the last podcast that when Jesus was resurrected, he then told his disciples, as the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. And he breathed on them the Holy Spirit, the streams of living water, that they would now be his ambassadors. They would be Jesus on earth. And that's still going on today. Us, spirit-filled people, that's that's our whole point, saying the kingdom is here, the temple is here, where we rise together as spirit-filled people. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, when he reminded the church at Corinth of the gospel, he says four times after he said, you know, I'll remind you in verse three and four that Christ died, he was buried, he was raised. You know, this is the gospel. It saves you. You take your stand on it. But then he says he appeared. And he four different times he says he appeared to Peter. He appeared to the 12. He appeared to more than 500. Uh, he appeared to James. He then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me, Paul, who's writing this. That's the one I'm normally born. And you're like, why is he making a big deal? So what that he appeared? So what that he appeared to all these people? Because he was sending them out. And then he says, so what? 
So verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what we believe. And my point is, he's what Jesus is doing is showing this, this future image of him conquering all our enemies, saving us, going to the right hand of God, giving us the Holy Spirit, and then we do this work based on the grace. The grace affects us. The power of the resurrection affects us, and we become a moving kingdom of God on earth where we're declaring Jesus as Lord and people are entering it. There's a lot of work going on. So then he goes through the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection, what I just read, the last enemy will be uh, destroyed. That's death itself. We'll be raised. He goes into the kind of body that we'll receive which is hard for us to get our heads around, but it was hard for the Sadducees to get their head around whose husband is this woman going to be? You know, because he starts talking about it's sown a perishable body. It's raised an imperishable body. It's sown in dishonors, raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, raised in power. Then he says, we'll all be changed in 51 of 1 Corinthians. And the perishable will clothe itself with the imperishable mortal with immortality, then death will be swallowed up in victory, which is the ultimate enemy. And he says, the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the point I'm trying to make is, therefore, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so that's what the kingdom is doing now. That's what all this means. That's why we're a part of this. So we don't go off and start doing various temple worships and wait. We are now, therefore, moving as Jesus via his Holy Spirit, and we're working. That was his point to the Corinthians. They had set up their own camp, were doing things that were distracting, that was not focused on Jesus. There was no kingdom work being done in the community. And that that was, I think, the thrust of what we're all a part of. So your point is, Jesse, well, say, the, the, the outer flow of what comes from that inner change is what you see then, mm-hmm. naturally. That's right. And then in our overtime segment— uh, and we'll close with this because we're almost out of time. We talked about the example of that being from John 4 because this Samaritan woman who he explained what living water really was, he told her, he said, there's coming a time and has now come when you won't worship on this mountain in Samaria or the one down in Jerusalem yeah. because this God is going to, you worship God in spirit and truth because he's spirit. And then her result and her reaction to that was what? She went down to the town where she was from here she was up here in shame, and she brought everybody out to meet Jesus. And so the very first missionary we even see yeah. was really this woman in Samaria, which is powerful. So uh, we're out of time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. I had an idea about this resurrection thing you described, Jason. I'm going to talk about that in the overtime. So if you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where we'll be. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.